Thank you, Sesna. And it was it's been such a privilege um to be able to work to work with you as well on this. And you know, really um really exciting and awesome that women were the first group um to be to be to be piloted. You know, it's um it was a really exciting opportunity for um a lot of women that were involved, including myself. Um so I'm just gonna share with you um I guess that some of the some of the framework and how it's rolled out. Um, over the year to improve the health, health literacy for women with HIV um, and it's the work that's been produced um, from 2019 and earlier this year. Um, myself and Diane Lloyd are two of the seven new community advocates as Sace mentioned before, um, but not everyone, not all the other women could be here today just about the commitments as we know women are carers and working and all that stuff. So at least you've got two of us here, so that's good. Um, but Diane does have some tech issues. so. You won't be hearing from her, but um, Diane, if you want to add anything that I'm missing, please. Yeah, actually, I might that. be able to. I might ah. be able to say hello a little bit. So. Yay! Hi. <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right. Away. Next slide, please. So yeah, please, then Diane, if you want to jump in, go for it. Um, so similar to what Jason was talking about, this sort of sets up the framework for the pilot group. Um, you can see on the first row. These are the challenges. So these are the about NAPWIS campaigns that we're failing to reach and resonate with all positive women and how to improve health literacy in relation to emerging treatment options and achieving a good quality of life. Um, and the second row across the top, you can see that's about the intended outcome. So increasing in HIV testing, engaging positive women in optimal treatment, reducing HIV transmission, improving quality of life and improving um, positive women's connectedness with peers. And the third row indicates how the framework we use W3 to approach, uh, to evaluate. Um, so the W3 framework, what works and why, was uh, developed by Dr. Graham Brown from the Trobe University. Um, and we use this extensively as well at Living Positive Victoria for the peer navigation program. Um, and just an amazing model to capture, reflect, um, and understand um, everything that's being evaluated. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and the uh, yeah, and the last row obviously is the community advocates down there um, that Sasa mentioned. Those beautiful women that are just so good to to work with, um, and really good diversity as well, and representation from across Australia. So, next slide, please. Oh, and also the partners you can see down the bottom on that previous slide. Um, so in this slide, it's a bit of an aerial overview of the scope of the work that's being covered um, in, the investigation, in the investigation phase of the project. Um, so the pilot um, for women living with HIV started in 2019 with two activities, one in Melbourne and one in Darwin. Um, there was myself, Precious and Emma um, created a workshop. I unfortunately didn't get to facilitate it. Um, I think I was down with the flu or something last year, but pressure, as Precious and Emma took the lead. Um, and facilitated a community consultation at the Living Positive Victoria office, where 10 women participated in a group discussion face-to-face. -face. Um, gift cards are given um, to women as, as an incentive of participation and also support to get there. So allowances or cab vouchers, things like that. Um, it was a three hour workshop in discussion about women's HIV journeys. Um, also talked about where women saw gaps, strengths and opp opportunities to improve their health literacy. So it was a very, very broad view of kind of gauging and trying to, I guess, sort of assess where women's knowledge and understanding of even what health literacy means. Um, in Darwin, Emma um, Sheldon Collins facilitated a similar group um, with support from NTAC. And there was 10 women from Darwin and the surrounding areas, which is amazing. Um, in the NT, the, the participants were from a very mixed um, group in terms of culture, linguistic background, but for the most part, all of the participants engaged with the same S100 prescriber in Darwin. Um, it's literally the one S100 prescriber in Darwin, I think. Um, in 2020, which is really cool, and you know, in the face of COVID as well, new community advocates did join um, the health literacy framework, but due to COVID lockdowns, um, the engagement quickly changed from face to face to a video format. Uh, everyone adapted really well to this as well. So Precious, Lara and Diane held one on one interviews over Zoom. So instead of being able to do the workshops that we could do, um, and it was a semi structured interview 
to form in-depth discussions about the lived experience of women and, and our HIV journeys. Um, these form participants in Queensland, Perth and Canberra, um, women from cold and linguistically diverse backgrounds, um, which was really awesome. So some really good representation there. Um, and early on from the group discussions, it was identified that health literacy support was a strong need for women in the areas of pregnancy and breastfeeding. And that's definitely where we, um, the project was governed. Um, so it did, it took a very you know, strong focus on that. And especially on the experiences of women who have been breastfeeding. Um, and we, there was um, eight women that were interviewed over group calls um, around that. So you can see all of the summaries, all the, the reports, the summaries of these reports, um, as they said, that are um, available from the NAPA website. And they're um, all down that right-hand side. Thank you. Next slide, Chloe. All right. So these are some of the key insights that came about from the community consultations. Um, this is proper meeker in action. I really, really love this. So it's about the relationship with peers and healthcare providers. They are, they, are, they are a strong point of exchange, information building and around health literacy. So where women are getting their information. Tim women was came up quite often. Um, and, you know, there's discussions about treatment, side effects, um, and, you know, discussions that are among, you know, safe peer spaces. We know how important they are. Um, health HIV literacy was low on the radar for the participants before their diagnosis. But what was surprising, what was unsurprising, I should say, is that some of their structural challenges in health in the healthcare settings. We know that there's a bias in some healthcare settings where women are not routinely encouraged to be screened. Um, HIV testing is typically not offered as a regular aspect of sexual health or general health checkups, but rather as a reaction to a situation. That unconscious bias that exists in healthcare settings is very present. Um, and we can see that in late diagnosis um, and presentation of women um, in, in clinical settings. But in terms of the health literacy and quality of life or the psychosocial areas, there were themes which are raised in connection with the need to consider mental health, HIV stigma, aging and improving social engagement. Next slide, please. Uh, so after this investigation phase, community advocates along with the NAPA project team consolidated all this information into areas of work so that we could really focus and implement and get, you know, start creating content that will actually bridge a lot of these gaps that we identified. So the four main areas I'll talk about today um, were about how targeted HIV testing campaign um, to focus to exclusively focus on women and heterosexual men. Um, Charlie will speak, um, NAPA Charlie, I should say, will speak more about this um, later on. And we wanted a NAPA campaign to include positive women's perspectives and representation. Um, NAPA, NAPA also has a project aiming to improve the experience of people receiving a HIV diagnosis. And NAPA's Daniel Readers will speak to about this later on at the HIV 101. It's a very exciting project. Um, thanks, Scott. <laughs> Um, and then also it was, um, uh, what we'd identify was about creating a women's community space. Um, it's really, really important about strengthening um, HIV health literacy. A lot more conversations happen in those closed door rooms. So it was providing space to address the relationship concerns, promoting the benefits of HIV health literacy, encouraging mental health literacy and facilitate support, reaching out to culturally and linguistically diverse women, ensuring that peer support is available, inclusion of champion healthcare providers. We wanted the creation of a specific health content on women's health support for women living with HIV in Australia who are considering pregnancy and infant feeding options. And that was, that was strongly came through so often. And even for women that may not particularly want to have kids or want to breastfeed, but still this theme kept coming up quite consistently. Uh, next slide, please. That's Diane. She had a brunch, that was nice. Um, so here are some of the examples of how we've implemented and tested some of the health liter literacy initiatives. Um, so in supporting and improved conversations with women through women's spaces, as we said. So Diane Lloyd facilitated a meeting with women in Perth. They brunched um, and reports back some of the project insights back to the participants who were interviewed. Through this meeting, two women decided to join up with Power, which is awesome, well done, and one woman who was moving to Brisbane relate, related to peers in QPP. So already just those networks are being built and solidified, it's amazing. 
Um, and in March, I was very lucky to get up to Darwin and um, facilitate a workshop with collaboration of NTAC, where we had 12 participants from Darwin and the surrounding areas um, come and just talk about navigating relationships, sex, and talking about their HIV status. Um, it was also the VS100 prescriber in um, Darwin, who was absolutely amazing, came and answered questions with them as well. It was such a important opportunity for these women to connect and, you know, learn about their similarities and, and sharing these health literacy, you know, messages and getting, you know, health literate together and, you know, building community. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and then testing, then the last part of the trial was testing and creating content for women by women, which we know is so important. And, you know, great people interviewing other great women, like, <laughs> this is a moment. Um, so at the Australasian HIV and Sexual Health Conference, I co-created a video series called Let Women Talk, uh, where I talked with various people in the sector who were presenting research about women's health. Um, we tried to keep the language pretty simple and translated the basic science back into the community. We shared the content by Tim Women and the NAPWA channel. It was, it was pretty well received, I think. Uh, that's still available. If you've missed it, you can still see it and enjoy listening to me more. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And we wanted to ensure that women's voices were heard and being represented on clinical symposia as well. Um, you know, often, you know, the voices of community are not really heard or respected in those spaces. So. Um, Emma Sheldon Collins represented as a community advocate on the HIV ARV, ARV guideline session on the adverse effects of ARV therapy, um, particularly metabolic impacts and weight gain at the 2020 ASHAM conference. And she did an amazing job. And I think you can still cast that, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, beautiful to see, you know, the lived experience of people in those spaces. Um, next slide, please. Um, more recently, we did a, um, a, a improving the conversation um, again in women's spaces. Um, and this is early this month, NAPA and Positive Women Victoria held a joint community webinar on breastfeeding for women living with HIV. Um, and coming soon is a community resource which has been in development for about a year to provide simple and straightforward information for mothers with HIV who are making the decision whether or not to breastfeed or to formula feed. Um, this is still a huge issue and even women engaged in really great healthcare and perinatal care are still not very clear about the implications of extra testing or, you know, what they need to do as well, um, you know, to see if they do choose to breastfeed. So, again, created by women for women and women with a lived experience of, of feeding. So this is awesome. Next slide, please. Um, and then coming in 2021, there'll be the redesign of the AFAO NAFWA website, Women Living Well, um, with, with, you know, it was hopefully um, a nice, um, you we know, will we'll have dynamic content and a newsletter. Um, so that's really, really exciting to see that website kind of get a breath of fresh air. So there's new content coming soon as well from the Health Literacy Framework. We have been busy. Uh, so the Breastfeeding for Women Living with HIV in Australia, that was a collaboration with Positive Women Victoria, informed by community consultations again. Um, yeah, so that kind of sums it up, a bit of a quick overview of, of the, H uh, the health literacy framework um, from investigation to implementation. Um, the framework is still in development, um, but yeah, there'll be definitely more things coming from this space. So Di, do you want to add anything? Um, I'd like to um, thank um, NAPA and Sans here for all the work um, and Ron especially as well for um, doing up the reports and that. What I found out with the group that I spoke to here, some were face to face and some were by Zoom um, the, during the interviews of like, there was such a, even though it's a small group, it was a very diverse group. Um, and the, you know, what come up again is the importance of peer support and sharing of information, um, where some of the women were very confident in, you know, researching their own health literacy or to others like relying on doctors for their information. Um, at the branch, as Sarah said, a couple of the women joined up with power, so that was really good. Um, and because one has moved, I, you know, introduced her to um, support over in Queensland. So, um, and in that group, a few of the women had felt that they had uh, been disconnected from support with other women and, you know, um, automatically, you know, shared their personal details to support each other. So 
you know, there's been quite a, even though there's going to be work done by NAPWA, the women themselves have also started other, you know, support and um, ways of sharing information. So, yeah, I think that there's been a lot of little side happenings that has been fantastic as well. So thank you. Yeah, totally, Diane. I think that as, once you bring women together, um, the way that they, you know, the, the, the bonds that are created, and I think that was really evident in NT as well. I still remember sitting in the room with these women and they realised they're all mothers and they just hadn't had that connection or that story before. So that was really beautiful. Um, yeah, so much. There's so much. We could keep talking about this for ages, but um, I will pass it over to Ash McCarthy. Um, and talking about the health literacy framework in respect to heterosexual men, the next pilot. Take it away, Anne. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Di. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here with you. Uh, just by way of introduction, um, I'm, as you probably guessed, a heterosexual man living with HIV. I acquired HIV as a child and I'm now 47. I'm married to a woman and we have two children. I also work at Living Positive Victoria as a peer navigator. It's a job I really love. In that role, I mainly, but not exclusively, look after heterosexual men in our community. I work with them individually and in groups. I have pretty good access to their views, opinions, stories, and experiences. At least those of them who engage with the peer navigator. And I have to say, many of them don't. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this slide just outlines the strategic thinking for applying the framework um, to heterosexual men in this instance, from problem identification through goals and evaluation. All of this is in recognition that transmission rates among heterosexual men have remained pretty constant concurrent with a welcome decrease in transmission rates among men who have sex with men in Australia in recent times. And uh, that um, straight men are generally, like women, more likely to be diagnosed later and with more advanced HIV. As a community advocate, I was genuinely consulted every step of the way from the beginning, from being approached by NAPWA to be involved. I was guided and supported in things like health literacy theory, but I was very much treated as an expert in heterosexual men's experiences. And I was recognized as a critical link to them. Saysena, Ronald Woods and John Rule were completely supportive. And so were my fellow community advocates. And I'm very grateful to work with them all to benefit heterosexual men living with HIV. Next slide, thanks Saysena. So um, in terms of the framework, we designed a way to consult with heterosexual men so as to learn from them. The initial plan was to consult them as a group in person so that they could hear each other's experiences and opinions in addition to sharing their own. I was to facilitate a discussion that would be recorded. The pandemic saw us need to modify our plans to consult them on an individual basis. I spent time developing and honing an interview guide and preparing to interview them by Zoom. The aim was to get a sense of where they get their health information and how they develop their health literacy and their HIV health literacy. And importantly, what we might be able to learn about heterosexual men that is important for organisations and services to be aware of when trying to reach them and messaging messaging them and through campaigns. I interviewed seven heterosexual men living with HIV located in various states from here in my bedroom during the Victorian lockdowns last year. All of them except for one were guys who I had delivered peer navigation to. Uh, the next slide please. So uh, Ronald Woods applied his analytical talents to the interviews to identify what could be cautiously generalised. And this is what he came up with. Um, one of the key insights was the importance of peer connections to these men, not just with the peer navigator, but 
uh, contact and quality time with female and heterosexual male peers. And I'd like to write, read out a quote from one of the men in one of the interviews. Quote, it is especially important for heterosexual men. Having that connection with other men definitely helps. As soon as they meet another straight man, they are more willing to engage with HIV. The role of positive women for them is just as important. Please keep in mind that all of the men from the interviews had been recruited from among my peer navigation clients, so they can't be considered a random sample. Um, another key insight, a tendency, and that was a tendency among the men to go on an information seeking spree early after testing and diagnosis using the internet, HIV health professionals and peers. This usually led to a very good understanding of how treatment and being adherent leads to viral suppression and how that is beneficial. In academic terms, this could be called functional health literacy. Um, another key insight, uh, starting treatment and achieving undetectable viral load appears to give the men confidence in the science. And knowing this uh, should inform our interventions and messaging um, that is designed to reach them. And, and going on through um, the key insights, the importance of privacy and sharing HIV status with a very small number of people was, was key. Um, the intersection of HIV with substance use. And as you would expect, themes of stigma, isolation and loneliness impacting on quality of life emerged too. And to quote another one of the men, HIV has destroyed my life. It has been a huge burden on my life. My main concerns are around loneliness. It still feels unreal. I have not had sex since my diagnosis and I don't feel okay about needing to share the information on HIV with sexual partners. There's the thing of not being accepted. End of quote. Um, and just quickly, other ones were themes of travel and engaging with sex workers, especially in Southeast Asian countries, a desire to address poor HIV health literacy in the wider community, especially around U equals U, and the value of PLHIV networks as pathways to improving their health literacy. And my final slide is really um, the exciting stuff these are some of the ways that the health literacy framework will enable more confident and coherent inclusion of how positive heterosexual men traverse health systems and reach positive and tangible health outcomes. Charlie and Daniel are going to talk about the first two, so I'll leave that to them. Uh, the third one um, will be working with ASHAM. And the fourth one, um, uh, a national network of heterosexual men, I guess, uh, might begin with the very men who participated in the interviews. If they wish, we will assist them to set up a private, peer-friendly online space on a platform of their preference, for example, WhatsApp, and have them promoted among their own networks of positive straight guys in various locations around the country. And this, I'm hoping, will allow the consultation and the conversation to continue. Another um, emerging idea is to create a resource of recommendations to disperse to organisations that deliver care to people living with HIV regarding ways for including, reaching, catering to and messaging heterosexual men living with HIV as a distinct cohort. And can I leave you with another quote um, from one of the men? I feel much more empowered now. Health literacy is not only about what I know, but also what other people know. And this helps me to be empowered. It's not about pleasing the doctor, rather it's the other way around. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>